Good morning, and welcome to NeoConnect 2020. <laughs> NeoConnect is NeoCon's online series of resources, programming, and events designed to connect the community throughout the month of June. I'm Monica DeBartolo, NeoCon's Director of Programming, and I want to thank you for joining us. Today's session, Surface Materials Influence on MRSA Contamination, is approved for one CEU credit for interior designers, one LU HSW for architects, and one EDAC unit for healthcare designers. You can find details on CEU credits in the center of your screen. So let's begin. Today's timely topic will reveal a health danger in materials that designers should fully understand so as to minimize the danger and help to combat infections on hospital surfaces and interior environments. Dr. Deborah Harris is an evidence-based design researcher, product developer, and designer. She is an associate professor in the College of Health on human and Human Sciences at Baylor University and a fellow of the Center for Health Systems and Design at Texas A&M &M University. Her material science laboratory is a resource for environmental material testing and specimen preparation for product lifespan, durability, simulation, and performance tests. Her research involves chemical exposure risks of materials and surface material influence on the spread of healthcare-associated infection. Her body of work is focused on factors affecting user experience and outcomes, especially related to health productivity, safety, and cost implications of the physical environment. Please welcome Dr. Deborah Harris. I'm looking to, oh, here we go. Thank you, thank you. Sorry for the slight delay. Um, I was trying to share. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. I'm gonna present a project. It's a relatively small project, but we were looking at surface materials influence on MRSA contamination. So I'll just um, jump right into it. Uh-oh, here we go. All right, so our learning objectives today are, are how material composition impacts surface wear and ability to harbor pathogens, how cleanliness is a factor in the ability for bacteria to survive on surface materials, the difference between material effectiveness when disinfecting with a standard um, chemical agent and a novel um, chemical agent, and the effectiveness of the novel de decontaminant used to disinfect five different surface materials. So, um, you know, over the past uh, couple of decades, the, the last 10 or 15 years, I would say, there's been a lot more evidence um, from the scientific community about uh, the accumulated evidence of uh, contamination of environmental services and the role that they play in the transmission of healthcare acquired pathogens. So um, this reference down here at the bottom um, by Dr. Weber, it, it, that's a lit, uh, literature review and um, has a lot of these key sources that would be um, along the lines of what we're gonna talk about today. So I'm going to um, go through some background. Some of this uh, might be very um, basic for some of you and maybe uh, for others not so much. But, you know, um, survival. So the, the study we conducted was the role of environmental service materials on contamination and eradication of MRSA. And, um, you know, just some background on that. So some materials can be a reservoir for pathogens. We know that some materials act as a sink. Um, when you think about um, the, the continuity of the surface, there may be um, inconsistencies that allow biofilms to attach, that sort of thing. Um, and we know, we've, you know, we know from the literature that some of these pathogens can last days, weeks, or even months on certain kinds of materials. So um, 
and you know that evidence is really looking at materials that are in an environment and it's being tested in a in a situation where there's soil and um, other other things that are helping to support the viability of the bacteria and um, and then of course the bio burden in a healthcare environment is the three feet that surround a patient's bed so if you have a patient that's MRSA positive there's a whole host of surfaces in that environment that are probably also positive for um, MRSA and uh, will need to ha be decontaminated you know in a heightened level rather than a more general level um, that some cleaning regular cleaning would require so um, you know this study really looked at common building and finished materials we were looking at surface materials to start off with um, we looked at material comp composition and attributes and um, we also looked at cleaning processes because there's a lot of, you know, the CDC documents from 2003 and 2008, you know, talk about protocols and cleaning agents and all of that. And, and the, um, the CDC also, like with the current COVID crisis, you know, they have the end list that has all the, the materials and, and cleaners on it that are rated for for killing that virus so um i don't know if you've looked at that document but it's 25 pages and growing so it can be pretty confusing for people to think about you know how you want to maintain the cleaning process and how and surfaces might play a role in that so and then a lot of situations you have environmental services that are you know, having certain, you know, a range of cleaning and disinfection, um, you know, quality of that. So there may be inadequate cleaning and disinfection. You know, a lot of these um, environmental services groups are using monitoring systems as a way to help increase compliance and in, in getting those services clean so that you're not leaving, you know, a nutritional source for bacteria. Um, the other thing is that you have continuous transmission so um, bacteria you know they're they can become part of a biofilm so they might attach and stay where they are they can also be transported and um, to other environments from a secondary you know a secondary vehicle like the the edge you know we've all heard about the study of the doctor's tie and the contamination on it so you know that kind of thing where it's um, picked up and transported to another location and then, you know, products used, methods employed, frequency, training, monitoring, and adherence. These are all issues that come up that have to be coordinated in a way that um, is productive for that environment to provide a safe and healthy um, healthcare experience. So a little bit about hospital acquired infections. There's uh, about uh, 1.7 million deaths in the US annually. And um, you know, we talk about that in like public health terms, that's a lot of people that die um, at the hands of an HAI. But then when you look at the personal cost of that, you know, there's a loss of productivity. Someone may lose their job or become disabled and not be able to do their job there's a loss of income plus the cost of all the expense that comes with that and it can have an impact on quality of life for the individual so um, this is just a, a shot of a hospital um, and some x's kind of showing high touch areas that can harbor pathogens during the course of a of a, a patient residing there. So you can see um, there's different materials, there's different, um, you know, um, parts of the environment. Some of those are touched by um, healthcare workers, some of those are touched by the patient, some of them, those, and then you think about all the people that come behind them. Um, healthcare staff of various levels and um, visitors. And you can start to see how these things grow and, and become prolific through the environment. Another important aspect is thinking about um, cleaning and sanitizing and disinfecting. And I, I 
borrowed this slide from a friend of mine because I just like it so much. But uh, I think that a lot of people get confused about um, what it is. So when we use the term, oh, well, that room has to be, you know, cleaned, uh, terminally cleaned for, before the next patient comes in, um, that really means cleaning and disinfecting, although that's the term that's used. So the other important aspect is that you have to understand that cleaning has to happen in order for sanitizing and disinfection to happen. So cleaning includes removal of material like dust, soil, blood, bodily fluid, anything, any debris that's left behind. And it, you know, typically that's physically removal. Um, you're, you're not trying to kill organisms so much as physically remove them and reduce them. And that can be accomplished in a number of ways. So mechanical action is you know, literally someone actually spraying and wiping down a surface, for instance. Um, and a lot of detergents are capable of removing and even destroying um, some pathogens. And then, um, it's, it's like I said, it has to happen before disinfection or sterilization. And if it hasn't been cleaned properly, then it cannot be properly disinfected or sterilized. Sanitizing is more, is more like a general claim of germ control, but typically not organism specific. So there's two different kinds of sanitizers. One is food contact um, rated and one is food, non-food contact rated. And, um, when you look at that, you, the differences are, you know, food contact services have to be 99.999%, whereas um, non-food contact is a reduction of 99.9. Now, to most of us, that doesn't seem like a, a big difference, um, carrying out those two decimal points. But, um, you know, there's a time attached to that, so that has to happen within 30 seconds, and you have to have a reduction of three logs, which is an, an, you know, an account of colony forming units, and or a five log reduction for food contact services. And then disinfection is the inactivation of pathogens. So um, at this point, you're not interested in removing them so much as eradicating them or inactivating them. And it usually involves heat or um, chemical agents and or something like UV, uh, ultraviolet, um, like we see with the robots that come in and, and sterilize that way. So it destroys microbial life and it, it, that includes bacteria, viruses, spores, and uh, fungi. And then most common uh, disinfectants used are quaternary ammonium compound products hydrogen-based products and sodium hypochlorite or, or bleach products. And um, when we look at this slide, you can see how those things play out. So again, um, this slide basically shows you, if you look to the left, you can see easy to kill leading to hard to kill as you go up in this uh, chart. And you have the, uh, you have pathogens listed um, by classification, and then you have an example which is more in tune with the things we know. So MRSA is down there at, near the bottom of the list uh, with with uh, vancomycin resistant enterococci, and you can see athlete's foot is above that. It's harder to kill than MRSA, and then norovirus is kind of in the middle. Then you have TB. Clostridium difficile, mad cow disease, kind of going up the ladder there. And so you can see here which disinfectants can kill at which level. So, you know, you always want to use the least uh, corrosive and least, um, you know, health impact um, disinfectant that you can use to do the job adequately. So you can see that MRSA is easily killed by quaternary compounds along with BRE, HIV, and athletes. But, and then as you get it higher in the list, you start to see an intermediate level disinfectants where um, that might be combination um, disinfectants that combine alcohol and quaternary compound blends. And then bleach starts to enter the, the, uh, the, the side there. It kind of goes across the intermediate and the high level. And then parasitic acid or uh, hydrogen peroxide blends, those are the things that um, really move up the, the ladder but are you know, much more um, 
complicated to use and, and, and you don't want to use something that is over overly done to kill something that you can go in and have people at, at less risk for. Um, so those are the things in terms of disinfection to think about. So this methodology of our study, the MRSA study, um, we, we did a number of things in there. Um, first of all, just from the sample prep standpoint, we did a simulated wear using a Tabor rotary platform abrasion tester. And to do that, um, you know, we looked at the standards that were available and we found that there were a variety of standards for wear testing based on the material. And um, from, from my perspective, I was trying to look at, well, you know, the wear doesn't change depending on who's, you know, if you have a counter installed at a nurse's station, it, whether it's made out of, you know, um, laminate or solid surface, it, it's still being worn the same way. It still has the same papers being scraped across it, you know, hands, computer terminals, whatever the thing is that's going on, the cleaners that are being used on it, whatever the corrosiveness levels are. And so what we decided to do was to take um, a uh, high, um, high pressure laminate and uh, do a study to wear it to failure and then um, back out the number of rep, you know, the re, re, of the times the Tabor rotary turns um, to equate to or to simulate about six years of use. And then we use that, that uh, number of rotations on all of the materials so that they were all being worn the same way. Um, and that, with the objective that they're not failing, they're just being worn. And then, um, you know, and then we sterilized all of the samples that we were using through an autoclave process so that we were starting with a clean surface. And then um, in AIM-1, that was focused more on material composition. So we looked at material mass loss from the wear study. Um, and we did that by uh, looking at um, scanning electron microscopy, SEM microscopy, and atomic force microscopy, and which is pretty interesting. So scanning electron microscopy is just like, you know, the best microscope. It does it just covers a lot of territory and so much better than what you what you know what you would have just sitting on your counter or your kids microscope for school um, atomic force microscopy is interesting because it has these tiny needles that go across the surface of the material and it provides you with quantitative data as opposed to you know qualitative visual data um, and from that one of those things that we got from the AFM was the surface roughness scores. So th that was able, you know, that was to tell us um, what the changes might have been in the material over time during wear. The rest of our methodology really focused on the microbial part. So we did a we did a study that looked at um, viability of the Pathogen. So how long can MRSA survive on the material samples that we were um, that we were testing and uh, we did we counted we did see a few counts at five minutes, two hours, 24 hours and 72 hours and we used contact plates for that. So we were actually using live samples that we were inoculating with the contain with the MRSA and then using contact plates to lift off the um, colony forming units, you know, that would be uh, put in the incubator and um, ready for counting the next day. And then um, in AIM-3, we looked at um, disinfection using a healthcare grade bleach and, um, you know, which, which falls into that um, easy to know that it's going to kill MRSA. I mean, we had no expectation that there would be a problem with that. But what we would do is um, we inoculate a different set of materials from AIM-2. And through that, we would, um, we would um, test the effectiveness of the, um, or I'm sorry, test the counts, like we would sample and count before it was disinfected. And then after disinfection, we would also 
uh, do the same contact plates and, and um, incubate and then test those, count those to see at what was left. And then in the mi microbial no novel disinfectant, disinfectant that, that was a product called Decon 7. It's a combination cleaner, so it has um, quaternary compounds, it has hydrogen peroxide, has other salts in it, so it's a combination of cleaners and disinfection, disinfectants. And um, from that, we, we basically ran the same test that we did for the bleach. So we looked at um, CFU counts that were obtained before and after the intervention. So this is just a, an image that kind of shows <laughs> the production of, of things. Um, in this image, you can see um, the, from the Tabor abrader, you can see those circles. That's where the materials were worn. And of course, we also had samples that were not worn. So we were able to, um, you know, we, we tested samples before they were worn. And then we had worn samples that we also tested separately. So, um, we were the, basically this is the the process of um, inoculation and then getting them prepared to be contact plated and incubated for counting CFUs. And then this this slide just shows the five um, materials that we used in our study. So we looked at stainless steel because that's the gold standard in healthcare environments. We looked at high pressure laminate because that's that is still, uh, there's still, you know, miles of that in healthcare environments. And then an acrylic polymer solid surface. So uh, we're seeing more solid surfaces in environments. And then we had two products that had copper. So one was sheet copper and the other one was a solid surface that had cupric oxide added to it. The first thing we did was our material science studies, so looking at percent um, mass loss. And so, um, you know, what we found from that is that the copper sheet and the high pressure laminate had the highest percentage of mass loss and stainless steel had the least percentage of mass loss, which shouldn't be shocking. It's a very hard material. Um, the percent mass loss of, of um, you know, when you compare the new version of the material and the aged version of the material, um, you know, copper sheet and the solid surface with cupric oxide had um, significant loss of material mass after abrasion. It was <clears throat> statistically significant, um, but there were no significant differences for high pressure laminate, acrylic um, solid surface, and the stainless steel. So in terms of mass loss, that, that was the breakdown um, for that. You can see from the chart kind of how that plays out a little bit. And then this is the um, microscopy, the SEM microscopy. So um, you, in the, you can see the labels. We have stainless steel and then the laminate and then the acrylic solid surface on the left and the two copper um, products on the right. And um, you know, SEM uh, uh, and the AFM of new and worn samples revealed differences in surface topography among the different samples. So um, while stainless steel showed the least surface roughness, of, so we talked about surface roughness, that was the AFM. And I have a, sl a really great slide of that in the next thing, but just, you know, in terms of looking at surface roughness of all the analyzed surfaces, the new acrylic polymer solid surface and the high pressure laminate showed the highest surface roughness um, of the new materials. And then the worn materials, um, the stainless steel and the solid surface with cupric oxide appeared smooth in the SEM and AFM, the surface of the acrylic polymer solid surface, high pressure laminate and copper sheet appeared flaky. So now you're starting to get into this, these uh, differences of, you know, after, after they're worn, how do they behave and, and, and what is the material composition of that? And then this is the slides for the microscopy AFM. My, the, the microscopy, the, the, um, researcher that 
that I worked with on the microscopy, he's like, no, 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 you don't show the three-dimensional images. That doesn't get published. You only show this on the left. I did this. This is set up. This is the way it's supposed to be done. And I'm like, yeah, you don't understand. We're visual people. We want to see the cool 3D stuff. So here you have it. You've got stainless steel at the top. Uh, new and worn, so A and B, uh, you know, on either side, and you can kind of see how the differences play out. Um, high pressure laminate, the acrylic surface, the uh, acrylic solid surfaces, and then, and then again the the copper surfaces. So wearing of the material did have different effects on surface topography of the different materials. Wearing strongly increased surface roughness of the copper sheet. Remember copper sheet is pretty soft material so we're not shocked by the fact that wearing would would rough that up. Um, but it decreased surface roughness on both of the solid surface materials. So over time you know with the simulated wear it actually made the acrylic solid surface and the solid surface with the cupric oxide smoother than it was in its new state. So uh, these are interesting things because, you know, when you think about um, the topography being different on the copper sheet, the question is, will that harbor, will that present an opportunity for any material, not specifically copper, but having that, would it harbor pathogens and then you have to think about in terms of the smooth surfaces, how does that play in terms of biofilms? Will biofilms not adhere to it because it's smooth or will it be more likely to adhere to it? So, you know, those are some of the questions that come up in terms of the materiality of the, of the products that we were testing. So, in the study results of AIM-2, this was MRSA viability. So this was looking at the length of time that MRSA was able to live. And this was in a laboratory environment, not in, you know, like a hospital unit. Um, so there was no soil introduced in this particular version of the study. So we were literally looking at how, how long can the, the MRSA survive without the soil, you know, in a laboratory experiment. So um, we were tested at five minutes, two hours, 24 hours, and 72 hours. And um, what we found, um, just full disclosure, is that MRSA grows very rapidly and then it dies off pretty rapidly when it's not provided, you know, the resources that it needs to sustain itself. So um, when it says CFU counts were independent, independent of surface type at five minutes, basically that's saying that it didn't matter what the surface was, there was a lot of MRSA on it and, um, and it was prolific. And then at two hours, it was the same. So um, we chose two hours because that's the amount of time that the copper materials are allowed to have on their label saying that um, bacteria starts to reduce at two hours or should be reducing. We did not find that, um, although I have to say that our data, our CFU counts were categorical and not numerical. There were so many of them that we were not able to discern a difference. And then at 24 hours, you could see the association between CFU counts and surface type because all of the copper services had reduced down to zero colony forming units while the other material still had um, MRSA, active MRSA on the samples. And then at 72 hours, all of the MRSA was um, neutralized on all of the samples. So, you know, um, given, given a little more time, we probably would have gone back and, and added some time points here so that um, we could get better data in terms of what happens between two hours and 24 hours and between 24 hours and 72 hours. But um, this kind of gives you an idea about, you know, different materials having different properties and, and, what, and what that might mean in terms of moving forward for, um, you know, disinfecting and having materials that actively, um, you know, inhibit the growth of, of, of uh, bacteria and other pathogens. 
And then um, on AIMS three and four, those were basically where we were, um, we inoculated the surfaces and then we uh, clean, then we uh, disinfected them once with the hospital grade bleach and once with the um, novel decontaminant, the de and um, we had new and worn materials in there and both disinfectant products were equally as effective. So what that means is that the wear did not have a, did not play a role in the ability to be disinfected. And, you know, if you look back at the disinfection, I mean, the CFU rates prior to disinfection, you could see, you know, the evidence was that the, the copper materials did have an active role in reducing the amount of bacteria that was active prior to disinfection. And then another thing that we looked at, um, we did these ATP tests. So a lot of um, a lot of hospital environmental um, services groups are using ATP as a monitoring system. So they might use that and go in um, after cleanings have happened with their staff and sample with a swab. You basically use a swab and sample a service and, and then you can put it into this um, this reader, it's a digital reader, and it has a, you know, it has a reagent in it, a fluid, so you shake it up and you put it in there and you wait for the reading, and it'll basically give you a, it's a relative light unit reading. So it, it doesn't equate to CFU counts, and ATP actually, you know, it picks up all of the debris. So it's not just, um, you can't think of it as like, well, look at all the bacteria on there because it's actually showing all of the debris that's on the surface that has been left behind. So we use this in our study to try and get a sense of, um, you know, how does, how does this rate in terms of ATP test results when, you know, people are monitor using this as a monitoring system in their hospital and you can, you can see how it plays out. So you have new and worn, um, on the before scale, um, so uh, you can see differences in stainless steel. The, the worn samples did have higher bacteria counts, um, and so did um, the solid surface and the high, uh, high pressure laminate. And, uh, but you can see across the new and the worn that the copper was reduced. Um, over prior to disinfection. And then when you look over to the after the um, disinfection, you can see that the, the debris left behind the ATP readings were highest on the stainless steel. Um, and, and then all the rest of them were pretty much knocked down to um, really low, really low levels of uh, RLU units. So, and then the bars that are there is basically indicating, I mean, not the bars, but the, the tails up there, that's basically indicating the variability between the samples. So these are just shown as averages that have been broken down by material type. So in conclusion, um, we found, you know, the, it's interesting because, uh, you know, our, all the materials, all the indoor finished materials, all the building materials, all the things that are in there, all the equipment that's in a patient room or in the hallway or whatever, those are all called non-critical environmental surfaces. And that's how they're categorized. And generally in the literature prior to the last 15 years, um, you know, the idea was, well, they're non-critical. They're not really that important. It's not like you're inserting it into somebody where a pathogen could be left behind. But what we know is that, you know, um, contamination, recontamination, cross-contamination, vectors of, tra of transmission, all of these things start with contamination on a surface that can then be moved to, you know, by a, by a healthcare worker, by a visitor, by a patient to another location, um, and, be, and, and also, um, you know, there's a risk of infection there. So we did show that there was a possible association between pathogen survival and material type. So, um, you know, that was just um, the difference between the, the, the copper um, 
materials and, and the others, basically. Uh, impact of wear on material on environmental surfaces did have an effect. Even though the stainless steel is a hard material, it had the least amount of mass loss. Um, it had, you know, it, you know, obviously it wears it wears well. Um, it also had the higher the higher numbers of CFUs and the higher numbers of um, ATP readings from the from the the RLU the RLU numbers from the ATP readings of the monitoring system, and then you know there's just an importance of uh, building and finished materials and protecting patients from multi-drug resistant organisms and other pathogens. So again, you know we were looking at MRSA in this study, um, but VRE is very prolific in hospital environments. C. diff is is prolific. Um, you know, there's a whole host of other viruses and pathogens that fit that bill. And of course, you know, now um, we know that a lot of these, these same viruses and pathogens are community acquired and, you know, our whole country is, is, um, is kind of dealing, being confronted with that right now. So um, for future research, um, right now, so we'll look at, at these, um, we'll probably add pathogens, but also uh, expand the list of materials. Um, I want to do more material composition studies and, and look at accelerated uh, ways of, of uh, testing things and looking at corrosion through chemical degradation. Um, accelerated aging, like what can, what can we do so we know what's going to happen and at the different points of the lifespan of these materials and what can we expect from them at that time. And like I said before, one of the limitations of the study was that we didn't have enough intermediate time points. So of course we would add time points and, um, and look at how we're concentrating the pathogen so that we can get numerical data instead of categorical data and have more discretionary results to show. Um, I would like to mention that right now, I have a study that is going on with a colleague at the Baylor College of Medicine. She, she has a BSL-3 lab and that's what the uh, SARS COVID um, two is rated and so she has the virus in her lab and so we're um, collaborating on a study looking at how long that virus can live on 16 different materials some of them are flooring some of them are soft some of them are wall materials counter surface materials the five that are in this study are in that study as well so it's a, a, a whole um, it's a much more expanded platform of materials that we're looking at um, and then we'll also be testing the same disinfectant for that um, for for that virus as well. Um, yeah, so that so that's going on, and it's a very interesting study, and we hope to have those results soon. So, thank you very much. I know this is kind of a, a brief study. I hope that there's some really good questions coming through. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at those and try and answer as many as I can. Um, ah, yes, I think I have an incorrect. First thing, CDC says 1.7 million HIA, HAIs, 99,000 deaths. Yes, that's correct. So that's my mistake. Sorry about that. Um, can you go into more, more into sanitizing and timing? I'm not clear on that. I'm not sure what that means. There are certain um, there are certain things that you can sanitize, and you not, cannot necessarily disinfect. A lot of soft surfaces, you know, there's some debate on on whether you can disinfect them or not. Um, sanitizing is basically like um, you know, disinfection has a much tougher line that you're crossing to say that something is disinfected rather than sanitized. So if someone is saying to you, oh, well, it's sanitized. Well, it, it might be, it might be clean. It might, it might be, it, it might have a certain level of disinfection, but it's not the same thing. Um, 
another another uh, question says, just curious how this information relates to the 2019 published CDC guidelines for using the healthcare physical environment to prevent and control infection. Um, I'm not sure, uh, I haven't read that guideline. Um, I guess I'm remiss in that, but um, I think that, you know, in terms, I don't, I don't know what that document says. I know that there are certain technologies that um, are not being utilized because there are not EPA standards. You know, the standards haven't caught up with the technology of new products, whether they're disinfectants or materials in terms of testing. So, um, you know, I, I think that in, in some ways that might be a limitation, but I think that there are new technologies, um, new materials, disinfectants, you know, using nanotechnology um, that may have some antimicrobial effects, using, um, you know, using other heavy metals, like you know, copper is not the only heavy metal that has antimicrobial effects. Um, you know, there's a lot we don't know about using materials like that because, you know, heavy metals are also toxic to humans. So, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, your in incidence of coming into contact that with those materials might have an influence. But um, I, I think that that is um, kind of where we're going and, and technology, you know, we're kind of like, seems like there hasn't been a lot in terms of, you um, innovation and all of a sudden we're like poised to make a huge leap in innovation and really kind of explode all the things that we're doing and how that might play into creating healthier environment healthier safer environments and um and and and, and this is part of that so i mean i'm just reporting the the results but you know there are a lot of different um products out there that are, that are, you know, not necessarily um, on the market yet, but they're, they're getting there, they're getting ready, um, that will provide completely different ways of looking at disinfection um, within the environment. Another question is, where is COVID-19 on the resistance to pathogens list? Oh, uh, I think you mean the slide that I had. And so um, COVID-19, so the SARS, so COVID-19 is the disease and the virus is the SARS uh, COVID-2 or, or COV-2. And um, that virus is actually on the low end. It is considered an envelope virus and which is, you know, categorically one of the easier ones to kill. So interestingly, one of my, concerns about this whole uh, pandemic is just that there is, hasn't been a, a whole lot of discussion about disinfection because the virus is very easy to kill outside of a human host. And so that should be the first go-to. So people are wearing masks, people are you know, staying at home, people are doing all these things that they think are going to um, help keep themselves safe. Um, and then, but then disinfection, like basic disinfection, surfactants that are, you know, and many detergents can literally obliterate this virus. So, you know, you go to the stores and all of the counters are wiped out. There's no, there's no um, 409 anywhere. <laughs> um, you know, there's a whole lot of um, products that are gone from the shelves and any of those um, or most of those anyways um, that that say that it kills you know whatever their label says probably uh, would do a number on this virus it's, it's not that hard to kill um, does COVID fit into the same level as MRSA yeah it's pretty close um, you know MRSA is a bacteria so it's a little different than a virus, but the virus and the MRSA is at that lower end. So you should be able to use a quaternary compound to kill it. Um, I imagine that mechanical cleaning would remove a lot of it and destroy a lot of it. Um, and then, you know, following up with good disinfection practices 
would, you know, help to assure those that occupy that environment that everything has been done to eliminate um, the risk of, of that virus. I'm trying, let's see if I can get down. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, wow. Where does COVID fall on the scale of how they, okay. I think I've already answered the, um, the question on the scale of pathogens and how easy to disinfect. Um, the, um, oh, a question about the solid surface that was tested. One was, it was uh, an acrylic solid surface. And then, um, and then of course the, um, the other one, you know, with the Cooper oxide was a different product. And then um, with copper being antibacterial, how does that play in with AFM? Okay, so the AFM microscopy really was just showing um, the disruption on the surface from the wear. So um, copper is a very soft metal compared to stainless steel, which is a really hard metal. And so stainless steel, when it was worn down, it didn't lose a lot of mass and you know, it, didn't, it didn't rough up as much, but the copper material did rough up a lot. Um, now, according to the copper industry, that does not impede the ability for copper to have its antibacterial um, properties. So, um, you know, it would be interesting to look at um, worn copper and some of these other materials and look at, okay, so what happens if you're exposing them, maybe with a soil load and some, and some pathogens, does it, is it easy, is it as easy to remove? Um, does it get destroyed before a biofilm is formed? All of those things um, I think are pretty interesting because um, as you rough up the surface, you create cavities, right, where, where something can, can, uh, can lay low in, but um, if it's going to be activated by the inherent heavy metal properties, then it's still going to be neutralized. So um, I think that it'd be interesting to see more work in that area rather than the studies that are out there that just show that it does reduce um, in the environment, which I, you know, are, are pretty important too. Um, how many Tabor cycles were done on the sample to mimic the six years wear? We, we did 500 um, rotations using a, uh, shoot, using a, um, the, um, the wear disc was a pretty hard disc. I think it was a K, oh boy, I don't want to guess. I don't want to guess and say, I, I just um, don't have that in my head right now. But it was a pretty, we used a, um, tools that would be, a, that would allow us to accelerate the process. So uh, we used a, a speed and uh, the, the disc and the number of rotations to accelerate things to get it to mimic the six year wear so that we weren't, um, you know, that, that was the contribution that was definitely not part of the standard was because the standard is looking at um, how many rotations using a certain <coughs> disc that, um, excuse me, uh, using a certain disc that might um, not have the same effect. <clears throat> and we were trying to um, have the same effect on all the materials and see how the materials behave differently. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> A lot of questions. Looks like the, the <clears throat> only the hard surfaces were selected in the study. What about the soft surfaces like fabrics? Um, this was considered a pretty small study, as you can, you know, as, as per my comments, there are things that we would change moving forward when we expanded the material palette. <clears throat> so we would include things like fabrics and perhaps wall covering and um, other flooring materials and other things. 
like we're doing with the um, with the SARS test. Um, and, um, you know, we just started out with the hard services because that's a lot of what people will come into contact with. Um, so I think that adjusting some of our methods and expanding that palette would be the next step. And, uh, and again, looking at the <clears throat> other studies that we could do to show um, accelerated aging of materials beyond just a wear test would also be an important part of that. Um, we, uh, the next question talks about were any fabrics discussed as being tested use of these cleaners on vinyl or vinyl alternates or only hard surfaces. Again, this was a limited test on this particular thing. We are testing um, the disinfectant on the virus tests that we're running right now on an expanded list of materials. And I think that that'll be really interesting to see, um, you know, what the differences are between, you know, a hard, a harder surface versus something woven or, or non-woven, but a soft um, textile or um, other materials that, you know, vinyl flooring, um, linoleum, all of those things. Um, the next question also talks about um, soft porous services and asks, can you point me towards any research on the viability of microbes on soft porous surfaces? Well, in a couple of weeks, I can point you to our research. <laughs> um, I think that there are, there's studies out there. Um, you know, there, there's definitely some studies that talk about how long for instance, MRSA lives on cotton sheets and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and in an environment where there's soil and, and body, you know, shedding, skin shedding and other things, you have a lot of, a lot of resources for bacteria to live. You know, viruses tend to get weaker at the longer they live. And so they don't, they're not as hardy as some, um, bacteria are in terms of staying prolific in the environment. But um, there's also studies out there because you know there's some um, soft surfaces or fabrics that have um, silver in them. And those are, um, you know, those studies are out there with comparisons and you know, I can certainly um, point you in the right direction on that. Um, okay, let's see what else have we got here. Need to add quartz materials to your list as they're being used in more in hospitals. Yes, they are. And we did. We added it to our list. Um, so the uh, COVID, the, the COVID study it does have an expanded list of even the hard materials. So uh, again, I, uh, um, I definitely wanted to add that in as we were, you know, moving forward this process. Can you speak about how the edge treatment, if there is one, can affect performance? You know, it depends on the material. I think I'm wrong. Yeah, uh, it depends on the material, right? So if you have a material that's laid on a substrate and might have seams, then that can, um, that can be um, a point of concern. So having edges that don't have seams might be really good. Um, you know, maintenance of those with seams. We did not, in our study, we were just looking at the material. We were not looking at installations with um, seams in it. So I can't really speak to that from a evidence standpoint other than, um, you know, if you have molded seams uh, or, or seamless edges, then, um, or just minimize the seams, then you can minimize that risk. But you know that might be something that needs to be looked at more closely and and have more definitive evidence on that. Um, oh, here's one. This might be our last one. Uh, these are great studies on surfaces, but the reality is all of these materials are constructed in some fashion. Has there been any study, or can there be? on these materials in composition or as they actually are in the environment. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of my work is considered applied research where we're conducting studies in the environment. 
Um, you know, there are other researchers that do the same thing, and there's a huge body of work on it in, in you know, academic peer-reviewed papers. So I think that a large part of that work is what has uh, shifted the view on non-critical surfaces and why they are an important part of the um, process of keeping, you know, the number of HAIs down is, is that they can no longer be ignored when we know that they're, um, you know, the, the materials as they're installed and as they're used and as they're cleaned or monitored or disinfected and, you know, testing that becomes a real, you know, that's real life applied research, boots on the ground stuff, and is very important. This is a lab study that I conducted that will, you know, lead to a couple of more lab studies. And then, you know, we're already talking with, you know, a VA hospital and another hospital system about doing applied research um, to follow up this, the more of the lab study piece. So, um, but there's been a lot of great work out there um, that that fits the bill of, of what you're talking about. Um, one last question. There's a question about um, testing silver in addition to copper. Um, we did not include silver. I think that when we get to the soft surfaces, it'll be easier to find products that have silver in them. Um, I know there are disinfectants that also have silver in them. And silver is another heavy metal that, that has antimicrobial properties and should be studied and um, both on the side of disinfection, but also about human health risks along with copper. I think that's all the time I have for questions, but thank you very much for um, tuning in. I hope you found this helpful and interesting and um, stay tuned. Thank you. Dr. Harris, thank you for sharing the results of your study and the informative presentation. And thank you to all for joining us today. Be sure to join us tomorrow for creating a strategy at the intersection of real estate and design. Thank you and be well.